We would like to show our respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of elders past, present and emerging on which this recording takes place. Um, shall we go into indictments? Yeah, what did everyone end up yeah, going yeah. to jail for? How long are they in jail for? Um, on December 30th, 1965, the Marion County Grand Jury returned first degree murder indictments against Gertrude Bazanuski and two of her three oldest children, Paula and John Bazanuski Jr. Good. Because mm. Stephanie did try to help her. Yeah. I mean, and that's one against how yeah. many of them yeah. were against you her. You have eight people in that house. Mm. Not including plus all the, Yeah, plus all the visitors and yeah. people coming around. Um, also indicted were Richard Hobbs and Coy Hub. It's interesting, actually, because, you know, how um, Gertrude and then Paula and John Bazanuski Jr. were, um, yeah, received the first degree murder indictments. In the f- This article doesn't talk about it much, but in the film it definitely portrays that John Jr. like did a lot of shit too. Yeah. To her, like... Yeah, he was not innocent for a little kid. He mm. was always like, how old was she? Was he? Sorry, he was like ten or something or twelve by that point, and right. he was always like, "Yeah, let's get her, let's get her, mum, let's yeah. get her, Paula," that type of thing. Like yeah. he was always, yeah, like in it, right, and wanting to do shit to her. Um, so also indicted were Richard Hobbs and Coy Hubbard. All were charged with having repeatedly struck, beaten, kicked, and otherwise inflicting a combination of fatal injuries to Sylvia Likens with premeditated malice. Three weeks prior to the filing of the indictments against the five defendants, Stephanie Bandanuski had been released from custody upon a writ of habeas corpus bond. With her attorney successfully contending the state had insufficient evidence to support any murder or combination of fatal injury charges against her. Stephanie waived her immunity from any potential impending prosecution while agreeing to testify against her family and any other individuals charged with abusing and murdering Likens. There you go. This was, ooh, this is a section from Paula Bananuski's psychiatric evaluation detailing her indif- detailing her indifference to Likens' mistreatment. Right. In February 1966. Interesting. Go on. She says, as just a quote, saying she, Paula, represented the situation as one in which the girl, Sylvia, had become become quite withdrawn and negativistic in her behaviour to the extent that she refused to eat and showed no response to pain. Okay. Yeah. Like Paula was trying to say that. Yeah. Yeah. That um, Sylvia had just become withdrawn and... Like that makes it any better. I know. Um, at a formal pre-trial hearing held on March 16, 1966, several psychiatrists testified before Judge Saul Isaac Rabb is as to their conclusions regarding psychiatric evaluations they had conducted upon three individuals indicted upon Lycan's murder. These experts testified that all three were mentally competent to stand trial. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Of course they were. Trial. The trial of Gertrude Bazanuski, her children Paula and John, Richard Hobbs and Coy Hubbard began on April 18th, 1966. All were tried together before Judge Rabb at Indianapolis's City County Building. And he sure surprised that went to County Court. I would have thought it would go up higher than that. For how know. serious the crime was. Anyway, go on. It says City County. Still county, though. Is it? Yeah. Initial jury selection began on this date and continued for several days. The prosecution consisted of Leroy K. New and Marjorie Wessner, who announced their intention to seek the death penalty for all five defendants on April 16. Some of them are children. Yeah, but they still freaking knew what they were doing. Is the death penalty even a thing for children under the age of 18? It may be, probably. Jesus. Okay, go on. They also successfully argued before Judge Rabb that all the defendants should be tried together as they were ultimately charged with acting in concert. Mm. 
right. in their collective crimes against lichens, and that as such, if each were tried separately, neither judge nor jury could hear testimony relating to a total picture of the accumulation of offences committed. That's fair. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. Each prospective juror was questioned by counsels for both prosecution and defence in relation to their opinions regarding capital punishment being a just penalty for first degree murder murder, and whether a mother was actually responsible for the deportment of her children. What does that mean, deportment of her children? I suppose actions. Oh yeah, true. Because she should be, well... At a certain age that she definitely is. Mm. The way a person stands walks particularly as an element of etiquette. So a person's behaviour, yeah. according to a North American um, d- 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 definition, oh, yeah. a person's behaviour or manners. Okay. So in other so words, whether be... a mother, the mother is responsible for what her children did. Yeah. Which, jeez, I'm sorry. Well, she forced them to. And that. Thought, obviously, they... Um, there was consequences by her hand if mm. they didn't abide by Not her. Not only that, she provides exa- an example mm-hmm. of how to behave. That's true. Yeah. And she encouraged it, mm-hmm. even if she didn't encourage it by brute force all the time. She still encouraged it. For sure. Jurors who expressed any opposition to the death penalty were excused from duty by <laughs> Le- Leroy bit, New. That's a bit weird, but anyway. Any who either worked with children, expressed prejudice against an, an insanity defence or repulsion regarding the actual horrific nature of Lycan's death were excused by defence counsels. Hmm. It's interesting. Mm, it is interesting. Why would they exclude people who work with children or... Um... I mean, it's fair enough that they... Ex- trauma. Excuse people. Got to, so, you yeah. got to remember, while we're reading this as a Wikipedia article, it's like, what, an hour out of our day? Yeah. Right? People who are in juries mm. listen to this yeah. stuff in gruesome detail yeah, for true. hours a day, for yeah. weeks. Yeah. So, if you're a person who works with children, uh, you probably would be sensitive right. to yeah. children and mis harm children, for one. Two, you probably would remember that as a traumatic experience. Mm. Um... Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Because that would... Okay, so they're kind of, like... Yeah, Leroy New is actually kind of doing them a... Doing them a favour. Yes, doing... That's what I'm looking for. Doing them a favour by excusing them um, and even excusing people who were repulsed by... Oh, yeah. ...the natures of the events, so... Oh, yeah. So, you know, it caused then further... Psychological trauma. trauma. Yeah. Goes on from our, um, what's it called article I read the other day about the longest trial yes. went for two years and these people were with the jury for two years and when you're sitting on a jury like during trial you can't talk right so these people in this jury they had communication issues because they basically spent two years not talking to anyone besides jury. their own besides, besides the other fellow jury, jury and yeah. not not like they go eight hours a day not talking to yeah. anyone other than their families when they go it becomes home. almost like Almost in, in, institutionalized. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They had trouble going back to real world, to yeah. real life, because they had spent two years in a jury panel. Mm. Yeah. Um, Gertrude Benazuski was defended by William Urbecker. Her daughter Paula was defended by George Rice. Richard Hobbs was defended by James G. Netta. John Bazanuski Jr. and Coy Hubbard were defended by Forrest Bowman. The attorneys for Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard, Paula and John Batsonewski Jr. claimed they had been pressured into participating in Lycan's torment, abuse and torture by Gertrude Batsonewski. Gertrude herself pled not guilty by reason of insanity. She's not insane though. No, she's really not. Like She's not a good person, she's probably a sociopath, but she's not yeah. insane. There's testimony, prosecution, defence, rebuttal, Convictions, retrials, <laughs> retrials, go convictions. Let's just assume that they're all really bad people. And yeah, if you yeah. Want, want to read about the trial, it's all there. It is all there. Although the prosecution is um, interesting. Okay, then read that. I guess. Jenny, uh, sections of Jenny Lycan's testimony were later corroborated by that of Randy Lipper, who's, who's one of the people who was abusing her. He stated he had once witnessed Lycan's crying, but that she had shed no actual tears. Leper then visibly smirked as he confessed to having beaten Lycan's on anywhere between 10 and 40 separate instances. <laughs> Why would he smirk? He's the one who should be claiming yes. insanity. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, Gertrude, um, good old Gertrude, Gertie, 
testified in her own defence. She denied any responsibility for Lycan's prolonged abuse, torment and ultimate death, claiming her children and other children within her neighbourhood must have committed the acts within her home, which she described as being such a madhouse. She also added that she had been too preoccupied with her own ill health and depression to control her children. That doesn't excuse anything! No. no. Anyway, keep going. Yeah. Okay, so when Marie, it's one of the sisters, younger sisters, Bazanuski, was called to the stand as a witness for the defence, she broke down and admitted that she had heated the needle which Hobbs had used to brand Lycan's abdomen. Marie also testified as to her mother's indifference to Lycan's evident distress in relation to the physical and mental abuse she had increasingly suffered with her mother's full knowledge, stating that on one occasion, Gertrude had sat upon a chair and crocheted as she watched a neighbourhood girl named Anna Sisko attack Lycan's. <laughs> Psycho. Marie added that although all five defendants had repeatedly, repeatedly physically and mentally tormented Lycan's, she had most often witnessed her mother and sister committing these acts before her mother had forced Lycans to live in the basement where the abuse had further escalated and she had ultimately died. Another witness to testify on behalf of the prosecution, Grace Sargent, stated how she had sat close to Paula on a church bus and had heard her openly bragging about breaking her own wrist due to the severity of a beating she had inflicted to Lycans' face on August 1st. Sergeant has testified Paula had finished her boasting by stating, I tried to kill her. <laughs> Again, another person who should have said something, but at the same right. time, she's a child. So yeah, yeah. I know. On May 16, a court appointed doctor named Dwight Schuster testified on behalf of the prosecution. When questioned by Leroy New as the exhaustive interviews and assessments he had conducted with Gertrude, she had been evasive and uncooperative. Dr. Schuster testified as to his behalf that Gertrude was sane and fully in control of her actions, adding that she had been sane in October 1965 and remained sane to this date. Dr. Schuster was subjected to over two hours of intense cross-examination by Gertrude's lawyer, William Erbecker, although he remained steadfast that Gertrude was not and had never been psychotic. Right. Good on him. Is that, yeah, he question of over two hours about that. Jesus. Yeah, that's intense. Mm. Um, was it the prosecution we won? Yes. Yes. So De- Deputy Prosecutor Marjorie Wessner delivered the state's closing argument before the jury on behalf of the prosecution. As each defendant except Richard Hobbs, whose head dropped into his lab, lap, remained impassive, Wesner recounted the continuous mistreatment Lycans had endured before her death, death, emphasizing that at no point had Lycans either provoked any of the defendants or received any medical care beyond occasionally having margarine rubbed into scalded sections of her face and body. Referencing specific forms and means of abuse and neglect at the defendants' hands and their collective failure to either help Lycans or deter each other from mistreating her, Wesner described Lycans' abuse as a stomach wrenching and compared her treatment at the hands of all five defendants as being the equivalent in severity to that committed against prisoners in Nazi concentration camps. Mm. Quote, there was practically no fat on Sylvia's body. She hadn't eaten for a week. We'll never know the pain and suffering that Sylvia endured. The best evidence of that was the picture of her lips, lips that were bitten to shreds. Right. So it's from um, section of Deputy Prosecutor Marjorie Weston's closing argument at the trial of Gertrude Bazanuski. In reference to the premeditated nature of Lycan's death, Wesner pointed the jury's attention to the notes Gertrude had forced Lycan's to write on October 24, stating, Gertrude knew on October 24 she was going to hold these notes until she had the rest of the defendants, till she and the rest of the defendants had completed the murder of Sylvia. Holding aloft a portrait of Lycan's taken before July 1965, Wesner added, I wish you were here today with eyes as in this picture full of hope and anticipation. Convictions. The trial of the five defendants lasted 17 days. That's not long at all. Too bad. Before the jury retired to consider its verdict. On May 19th, 1966, after deliberating for eight hours, 
the panel of eight men and four women found Gertrude Bazanewski guilty of first degree murder, recommending a sentence of life imprisonment. Paula Bazanewski was found guilty of second degree murder and Hobbs, Hubbard and John Bazanewski Jr. were found guilty of manslaughter. But upon hearing Judge Rabb pronounce the verdicts, Gertrude and her children burst into tears and attempted to console each other as Hobbs and Hubbard remained impassive. On May 25th, Gertrude and Paula Bazanewski were formally sentenced to life imprisonment. The same day, Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard and John Bazanewski Jr. each received sentences of 2 to 21 years to be served in the Indiana Reformatory. It's not really a lot, is it? No, but the boy was only 12, wasn't he? Or 10? True, but or the, um, the old boy, the Richard Hobbs and Coy Hubbard, they were like teenagers. Yeah. But still, the court only found them um, guilty of manslaughter. Mm, which... Rather than, rather than murder. I mean, the daughter, Paul, only got second degree, like... But that's the thing. I need to remind myself what, what the degree is actually. I know, third, actually degree is, I know third degree is accidental. First degree is premeditated. But then what's the difference between first? That's what I'm saying. Third the, and manslaughter. That's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Second degree mo- murder, whoever causes... Moida. The, moida. Whoever causes the death of a human being without intent to affect the death of any person while committing or attempting to commit a felony offence other than criminal sexual conduct in the first or second degree with force or violence or drive-by shooting is is guilty of murder in the second degree. So you didn't mean to kill them, but they died at your hand, right. if that makes sense. Yeah. Like you, like Paula, she beat fucking, what's it, like Sylvia. Sylvia. Like fucking crazy. Yeah. But I don't. Th- they they are basically saying she didn't mean to kill her. True. She means to just keep harming her. Yeah. But not. Whereas third degree is whoever causes the death of a person by perpetrating an act eminently dangerous to others and invincing a depraved mind without regard for human life. Mm. Yeah. So first degree murder, any intentional murder that is willful and premeditated with malice aforethought. Felony murder, a charge that may be filed against a defendant who is involved in a dangerous crime where the death results of a a crime is typically first degree. Second degree, any intentional murder with malice aforethought but is not premeditated or planned in advance. Mm. So first degree, so Sylvia, not Sylvia, Gertrude got first Mm. because she did plan to kill her. Like there was genuinely, she's she made a plan to kill her. Second degree, Paula got that because she didn't intend to kill her. She was not premeditated. Yeah, but she but still she intended was also to kill her. I overheard her saying on the bus when she was bragging about like beating her up. But she didn't her pre- She was like, I, "I tried to kill her," and like she wanted to kill her. Yeah, but she didn't plan it beforehand. Yeah. I think is the the thing. Voluntary manslaughter. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Piper. Voluntary manslaughter, sometimes called a crime of passion, mm. is any intentionally intentional killing that involves no prior intent which was committed uh, under such circumstances that would cause a re- reasonable person to become emotionally and mentally disturbed. Both this and second-degree murder are committed on, on the spot as a spur-of-the-moment choice, but the two differ in the magnitude of the circumstances surrounding the crime. For example... A no, no, no. Okay. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because this happens in the retrial. Right. Okay. For example, a bar fight that results in death would norm ordinarily constitute second degree murder. If that same bar fight stemmed from a, 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 volu- a discover of infidelity, however, it may be voluntary manslaughter. So right. in other words, so voluntary manslaughter is you've done something to cause this. Yeah. Okay. So there was a retrial. Mm. In September 1970, the Indiana Supreme Court reversed the convictions of Gertrude and Buller Pananuski on the basis that Judge saw, Judge saw Isaac Rabb had denied repeatedly submitted motions by the defence counsel at their original trial for both a change of venue and separate trials. <laughs> okay. On a, on a, technical, venue, on a technicality. And why would you want separate trials anyway? The ruling further stated that this that the circumstances regarding the pre- judicial atmosphere created during their initial trial due to the extensive news media publicity surrounding the case impeded any chance of either appellant receiving a fair trial. I mean, yeah, but like... <laughs> I get that. What but... jury in their right mind, whether it's half a world away, is mm. going to think that they didn't yeah. murder. Like, well, it makes me wonder then what their convictions were at the end of the retrial. So, the pair were retried in 1971. 
On this occasion, Paula Vazanuski opted to plead guilty to voluntary manslaughter right. rather than face a retrial. She was sentenced to serve a term of between two and 20 years imprisonment for her part in Lycan's abuse and death. Despite twice unsuccessfully having attempted to escape from prison in 1971, she was released in December 1972. What? She yeah. wasn't in jail for a year. Yeah, yeah. <gasps> You're joking. Yeah. She deserved way more than that. Oh, yeah. Gertrude Bananuski, however, was again convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Yeah, suck Good. it. Over the course of the following 14 years, Gertrude Benazuski became known as a model prisoner <laughs> at the Indiana Women's Prison. Yeah, I bet. She worked in the prison's sewing shop and was known as somewhat of a den mother to younger female inmates. Oh, that's weird. Mm-hmm. Becoming known to some within the prison by the nickname Mom. By oh, the no. end, Mom. Huh? Oh, no. Yeah. By the time of Gertrude's ultimate parole in 1985, she had changed her name to Nadine Van Fossen. Isn't that, yeah, her middle name and her maiden name. Right. And described herself as a devout Christian. <laughs> I'm sorry. She can eat a dick. Oh, look at her face. I just, oops, I dropped it. It made me angrily drop a spoon. Look at this freaking cockroach of a woman. <laughs> Yuck. Catherine Keener is, uh, is playing her in the film was kind. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> Um, parole. News of Gertrude Beninuski's impending parole hearing created an uproar throughout Indiana. Jenny Likens and other immediate family members of Likens vehemently protested against any prospect of a release. Good. The members of two anti-crime groups also travelled to Indiana to oppose Beninuski's potential parole and to publicly support the Likens family. Members of both groups initiated, uh, initiated a sidewalk picket campaign. Over the course of two months, these groups collected over 40,000 signatures from the citizens of Indiana, including signatures obtained from outraged citizens too young to contemporar te contemporarily recollect the case. All signatures gathered demanded that Gertrude Bazanuski remain incarcerated for the remainder of her life. Damn right. Within her parole hearing, Bazanuski stated her wish that Lycan's death could be undone. Pfft. Although she minimized her responsibility for any of her actions, stating, quote, I'm not sure what role I had in Lycan's what? death because I was on drugs. What? I never really knew her. I take full responsibility for whatever happened to Sylvia. What? what the hell? Oh, God. Oh, my God. Taking Gertrude's good, good conduct in prison into account, the parole board marginally voted in favour of granting her parole. She was released from prison on December 4th, 1985. You can only see... hope that she was bloody beat in the streets, seriously. You can, you can, if you could see me right now, my eyes are This at the is why we need to head. do some like, <laughs> video streaming ones, which we will do. All right, I swear mean, we're nearly finished this, but we need to read the last part, which okay. is the aftermath, really. I really hope oh, she got released on the streets and they punished her. Um, following her 1985 release from prison, Gertrude Benazuski relocated to Iowa. She never accepted full responsibility for Lycan's prolonged torment and death, insisting she was unable to precisely recall any of her actions in the months of Lycan's prolonged and increasing abuse and torment within her home. She, she primarily blamed her actions Oh my god. Upon the medication she had been prescribed to treat her asthma. What? <laughs> Frank's face. What? <sighs> what medications is she thinking of? Because I can't think of any medications. Ventolin. I made her crazy. Not to mention she was a freaking chain smoker. Like, yeah, blame your asthma that you're causing from, you know, oh my god. smoking. People are dumb. Heaps. People are Heaps. dumb. Anyway, go on. Gertrude Bananuski lived in relative obs obscurity in Laurel, Iowa. Yeah, good for you, bitch. Until her death due to lung cancer. Oh, funny about that. <laughs> on June 16, 1990, at the age of 61. She lived too fucking long to do that. Reflecting upon the news of Gertrude Bananuski's death and the issues raised pertaining to her sanity at both of her trials... John Dean, a former reporter for the Indianapolis Star, who had provided extensive coverage of the case, would state in the 2015, I never thought she was insane. I thought she was a downtrodden, mean woman. 
Dean also likens the case to William Golding's novel Lord of the Flies. Yeah, I was thinking that too. Oh, yeah. Although oh, yeah. he has stated Lycan's increasing physical and emotional abuse was not a result of children going wild. No. It was children being told what being doing what they were told. Right. Yeah. No, I do see that. It's that herd mentality thing. Oh, for sure. Where you've got this, you know, matriarch who's like literally mm. telling like, beat her, beat her, that kind of stuff. Hey, yeah. hey, Johnny, get over here and beat her. Like, it's, that's how the movie portrays it. Too. You should watch it. I'd watch oh, it I don't want to watch it. Yeah, I don't want to watch really it. It's a really good film. Mm-mm. Okay. No. Um, in reference no. to Gertrude Banaszewski's actual motive for tormenting and ultimately murdering the Lycans, attorney Forrest Bowman. Uh, uh, opened in 2014 she had a miserable life doesn't what i think this what i think this was ultimately about was jealousy yeah of course it was of course she was jealous <laughs> of course it was. but fuck off you don't get to fucking just take a girl in and then you know take all your shit out on her yeah. like that is fucked up i'm interested to see what that happens. is fucked up gertie that is fucked up <laughs> i'm interested to see what happened to jenny oh uh, yeah and Never what happened to her system. parents yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, Jenny would be fucked up for life. Oh, like, for sure. She, yeah. Yeah. In reference, um, I know we've read that part already. Following her 1972 parole, Paula Bazanuski assumed a new identity. So, oh yeah, Paula got parole. Yeah, so like a year, a year after. Later, that's right. She worked as an aide to a school counsellor. <gasps> no! Years. At the, uh, if you can see both our faces right now, I literally just slammed my head into my hands because no. I have not obviously not read this before either. Oh my god, That's are you serious? That is fucked up, Paula. She worked as an aide to a school counselor for 14 years at the Iowa Beeman and Conrad Liscom Union Witten School District, having changed her name to Paula Pace and having concealed the truth regarding her criminal history to the school district when applying for the position. This is why working with children checks are a thing. True. Yeah. Anyway, she was fired in 2012 when the school discovered her true identity. Fuck you, Paula. Oh Paula God. reportedly lives in a small town in Iowa. She is married and has two children. <gasps> Let's hope she fucking cuts the. put an end to the fucking cycle. Oh my God. The baby daughter to whom she'd given birth while being tried in 1966. Oh yeah, because she was pregnant. Yeah, yeah, and whom she named after her mother oh. was later adopted. That's why she called the baby Gertrude. Gertrude. Yeah. Oh my god. And she adopted that baby out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The murder charges initially filed against Gertrude Bezanuski's second eldest daughter, 15 year old Stephanie, were ultimately dropped after she agreed to turn state's evidence against the other defendants. You go, Stephanie. Although prosecutors did resubmit their prosecutors did resubmit their case against Stephanie before a grand jury on May 26, 1966, the decision to later prosecute her in a separate trial never materialised. Stephanie Benazuski assumed a new name and became a school teacher. She later married and has several children. Um, Stephanie Serikstad currently lives in Florida. See, I don't believe, like, um, it might be because I saw the film as well, but, like, Stephanie was, like loosely quote the good one like yeah but I still don't think she should be a school teacher yeah but she didn't get convicted of anything doesn't matter it doesn't matter I mean theoretically in terms of being applied for working on children checks all that stuff because she wasn't convicted of anything she probably would have no no way like they wouldn't have anything to say no to people who are not convicted of anything here and who have probably done questionable things trust Mm. me I've known I've known a lot of teachers still get to be teachers yeah it's only if you actually have a conviction against you yeah that, that you're not going to get that work in children's check um for international listeners that's what you need in yeah australia. in australia to um it's like a criminal check yeah basically. it's like a police check and you have to get them renewed every two or three it's actually working years. children's check i think it's a combination of police check yeah. and criminal check it's yeah. like the in-depth one yeah that we have to pay for and that you get done um and yeah you need it to be able to teach i need it even though i primarily teach adults yeah just because some people entering tertiary education could be still minors yeah um yeah you needed to be able to do anything with a minor so coaching sports don't do anything with minors pardon what pardon (laughs) i said don't do anything with minors you know what i mean yeah we also have funny nicknames for the working children's check do we we do in australia yeah (laughs) <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm not going to say. Okay, okay. Yeah. But, like, yeah, um, yeah. if you're going to coach a sports team, if you're going to do tutoring, mm. if you're going to babysit, mm. if anything you're going to do with a minor, you have to work in the children's check. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so following the arrest of their mother, the Marion County Department of Public Welfare placed the younger ones, Marie, mm. Shirley and James Bernanuski in the care of separate foster families. That's shit that they got split up. The surname of all three children was legally changed to Blake in the late 1960s after their father regained their custody. Right. Marie later married. Marie Shelton died of natural causes on June 8th, 2017 at the age of 62. It's not very old, is it? No, not really. Um, Dennis Lee Wright Jr., so the one that she had with the... um, the young oh, guy. The second, yeah, the other boy, other the young boyfriend. Yeah, was later adopted. His adoptive mother named him Denny Lee White. He died on February fifth, twenty twelve, at the age of forty seven. That's not old at all. No. Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard, and John Bezanuski Jr. each served less than two years. That makes me so fucking mad. In the Indiana Reformatory before being granted parole on February 27, 1968. Parole is such a weird concept. Like, if you're going to send someone to jail, send them to jail. (laughs) Like, they'll go, oh, you've been good, you can come out now. You can come out now, be good. Yeah, it's bullshit. Um, Richard Hobbs died of lung cancer on January 2nd, so 1972, at the age of 21. Oh, lung cancer at 21. Hobbs. That's funny because his character in the film is played by Evan Peters, who I love from, like, American Horror Story oh, okay. and stuff. And yep. he plays at Silver Surfer. And, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. He's such a fantastic actor. And even though he's a teen in the film, like, 13, 14 years old, if that, he's got a crush on Sylvia. Yeah. So he ends up coming around to the house a lot. But Gertie, Gertrude, being the woman she is, she's kind of always talking and kind of flirting and stuff yeah. kind of seducing these young guys the young yeah. teenagers that come around so obviously yeah Richard or like when Ricky in the film was yeah a bit into that and he would just sit with Sylvia and smoke all their cigarettes and stuff so 21 not surprised if, if the film portrayed him in any like, like, like a chain smoker at 13 yeah, yeah exactly like he was literally yeah him and Sylvia were sitting there Ugh. chain smoking like lighting them off I mean yeah he was an awful person who did awful things but at the same uh, in the film though he doesn't Yes, he does get forced by Sylvia to, like, finish branding. Not, oh, Sylvia. not Sylvia, sorry, but Gertie to finish branding Sylvia's stomach and all that yeah. kind of stuff. But the way they portray him in the film is that, yeah, he's – I mean, he surely he should have just walked out. But, you know, um, he succumbed to, you know, peer pressure and he wanted to look – he was a nerd and he wanted to look cool around yeah. the others. I mean, but it's – yeah, and he's the only one they say in this article that – yeah, he actually showed emotion during the trials yeah. and stuff, whereas the others yeah. did it. But that's the thing, like I he is a he's done terrible, terrible things. But I don't wish anyone to die that young of something insidious as lung cancer. It was the sixties, like yeah, but, he was God, he that's so he was young. Cool and, yeah, it's literally it was such a different time. They would literally sit there smoking with their parents or yeah. adult figures in their lives and stuff like like it was just a pastime what they did was, yeah yeah especially you know, doctors of the 60s were still, still prescribing mm. cigarettes to my dad's house smoking at 14 yeah it wasn't the 60s though it was, it was the 70s it was the 70s how old are my parents yes nine the same age as my dad yeah so 60 60 mm-hmm. 73 mm-hmm. 75 yeah yeah but still we started smoking at 40. Yeah, but people knew by that point that was bad. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's very true. We're talking about mid-60s. Like, yeah. Kids, you know, if they were still being prescribed to, especially women, actually. Yeah. Prescribed if they Because it's a weight loss drug and it's yeah, distra- exactly. it makes you stress less and all that crap, which yeah. is true. Yeah, yeah. But it's, they all had all these... At the expense of lung cancer. Anxiety, anxiety issues and be like, yeah, go get some of these. And you literally bought them from the pharmacy. Mm. Yeah. So it's not really that surprising. It's not surprising, it's but it's still sad. Died at the age yeah, of 21. Gertrude got to live to, what, 65? And mm. he only got to live no, to 21. No. That was four years after his release from the Indiana Reformatory. In the years between his release from the Indiana Reformatory and his death, he is known to have suffered at least one nervous breakdown. Mm. Mm. Poor guy. See what I mean? Like, yeah. Poor guy. I don't think it was... From what they portrayed in the film, like he was not a strong character, and he was obviously weak of character, mm. and like he would, he was obviously susceptible to taking orders from, you know, such yeah. a powerful figure like, like um, Gertrude. 
and that's what she obviously got off on was having like it was like all the fright flies kind mm. of where she had these this swarm of children are coming and going from her house even yeah. some paying entry fees yeah um for her to literally encourage them and tell them yeah but do this do that but also all of those parents of all of those children who came into that house why aren't you paying attention to what your children are doing maybe it was 1965 like they didn't i know they'd be like come home before bedtime and yeah yeah and that 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 is from the streets but also houses and yeah that is very true but at the same time if you hear children talking about stuff mm. like this, tell someone. Yeah. Like, it's not... If, if your kids are sort of talking about this, don't pretend it's it's nothing. Mm. I, know it's well, no, six, I know it's the 60s, and the 60s were very, very, very different to how it is now, but at the same time, like, I don't know. Yeah, we like to think it's very different now, but we know kids are still... Yeah. Yeah, abused yeah. and stuff. Um... Following his 1968 release from the Indiana Reformatory, Coy Hubbard remained in Indiana and never attempted to change his name. Throughout his adult life, Hubbard was repeatedly imprisoned for various criminal offences, on one occasion being charged with the 1977 murders of two young men, although largely due to the fact the chief witness to testify at his trial had been a convicted criminal acquaintance of Hubbard's who admitted to having been in his company at the time of the murders. He was acquitted of this charge. It's a very long sentence. Mm. But he's one of those people who get who got caught in the cycle. Yes. I reckon yeah. he, he got charged with one thing and then that's it for him. Yeah. He's on in criminal charges for the rest of his yeah. life. And some, that happens to some people. And that's actually how a lot of people do who are in the system, stay in the system. They get charged with something petty. I mean, not in this case, they didn't get charged with something petty, but they get charged with something small as a teenager, Mm. and then they're just in the system for the rest of their lives. Um, Shortly after the January 2007 premiere of the crime drama film An American Crime, Hubbard was fired from his job. Well, there you go. It was going to come out soon enough, wasn't it? Oh, shit. Because he he didn't change his name. He died of a heart attack in Shelbyville, Indiana, on June 23rd of that year, at the age of 56. That's a mistake for not changing your name. Well, that's a mistake for being an awful person. That too. Way. John Bazanuski Jr. lived in relative obscurity under the alias John Blake. He became a lay minister, frequently hosting counselling sessions to the children of divorced parents. That's concerning. Several decades after his release from the Indiana Reformatory, John Bazanuski Jr. issued a statement in which he acknowledged the fact he and his co-defendants should have been sentenced to a more severe term of punishment, adding that young criminals are not beyond rehabilitation and describing how he had become a productive citizen. He died of the Beatus diabetes. The Beatus. The Beatus. He died of diabetes in the Lancaster General Hospital on May 19th, 2005 at the age of 52. Another young Yum. woman. Prior to his death, he had also occasionally spoken publicly about his past, readily admitting he had enjoyed the attention Lycan's murder brought upon him and also claiming to have, quote, only ever hit Sylvia once. That is bullshit. That's bullshit, but at the same time, it's good to see that he did, um, what's it called? And some remorse, Some guess, remorse and some change. Mm. Though I still wouldn't want him around children. Right. To the injury to person charges brought against the other juveniles known to have actively physically, mentally, and emotionally tormented Lycan, so Anna Ruth Sisko, Judy Darlene Duke, Michael John Monroe, Darlene McGuire, and Randy Gordon Lepper were later dropped. Sisko ultimately married. She died at she died on October 23rd, 1996, at the age of 44. Already a grandmother. Already a grandmother? Wow. Lepper, who had visibly smirked as he testified to having hit Lycans on up to 40 separate occasions, died at the age of 56 on November 14th, 2010. All dying very young. Was it just... It, Come, it comes weird. from... If these people, from what I can gather, come from a relatively lower Holy, class yes. area... Yeah. As a general rule, if you grow up mm. in an area like this, you are going to have a, a lower life expectancy. That's just statistics speaking for you yeah the one you want to know about jenny likens mm. later married an indianapolis native named leonard reese wade 
The couple had two children. Oh, she died of a heart attack on June 23rd, 2004, at the age of 54. Yeah, young looking. Yeah, at the time of her death, Jenny resided in Beach Grove, Indiana. Um, 14 years prior to her death, Jenny Likens Wade had viewed Gertrude Basinewski's obituary in the newspaper. She clipped the section from the newspaper, then mailed it to her mother with an accompanying note reading, some good news. Damn old Gertrude died. Ha, ha, ha. I am happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, Gertie. The damn old Gertrude died. That's good. What a great note. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth and Lester Likens, so that's the parents, mm. the Carnies, died in 1998 and 2013, respectively. That's a ah, big so difference. Elizabeth died earlier. It's that's usually, unusual. It's usually, yeah, the man yeah, dies first. In the years prior to her own death, Jenny Likens Wade had repeatedly emphasised no blame should be placed upon either of her parents, replacing her and Sylvia in the care of Gertrude Benazuski. No, it's not their fault at all. Stating all her parents had done was trust Gertrude's promise to actually care for them until their return to Indiana with the travelling carnival. Yeah, they did nothing wrong. I yeah. suppose nowadays, though, people, if they're going to put their children in the charge of someone else, it's usually relatives. Yeah. Uh, that's not always a good thing. It's not either. always a good thing. Um, but people are a bit more picky. Mm. This there was oh, there's a picture of a granite memorial dedicated to the memory of Sylvia Likens and, and her legacy. This memorial was formally unveiled in June 2001. Um, it's there's a poem inscribed on the granite mem- mem- uh, memorial, formerly dedicated to Sylvia Likens' life and legacy in Willard Park, Indianapolis. If we ever go to Indianapolis, we'll have to have a look. Mm. It says the poem says, "I see a light, hope. I feel the breeze, strength. I hear a song, relief." Let them through, for they are the welcome ones. What a mess. Mm. The house, oh, I'd love to bloody see the house, at 3850 East New York Street, in which Likens was tortured and murdered, stood vacant for many years after her death. Oh, yeah, I don't think anyone would want to live and there. And the rest of her tormentors be like, yeah, <laughs> come live in the murder house. Um, the property gradually became dilapidated. Mm. Although discussions were held in relation to the possibility of purchasing and rehabilitating the house and converting the property into a women's shelter, the necessary funds to complete this project were never raised. That's a shame. The house itself was demolished on April 23, 2009. The site where 3850 East New York Street once stood is now a church parking lot. I mean, I don't think anyone would want to live in a house like that. Mm. I know I wouldn't. Torture health. I would no, I wouldn't. Not. In June 2001, oh yeah, this is talking about a memorial, a uh, six foot tall granite memorial was formally dedicated to Sylvia Lightman's life and legacy in Willard Park, Washington Street, in Indianapolis. This dedication was attended by several hundred people, including members of the Lightman's family. The memorial itself is inscribed with these words. The memorial, quote, this memorial is in memory of a young child who died a tragic death. As a result, laws changed and awareness increased. This is a commitment to our children that the Indianapolis Police Department is working to make this a safe city for our children. So, yeah, and then it's got um, media stuff. So, yeah, there's obviously the film that it fe- that led me to this. It was a 2007 film, An American Crime, which is directly based upon the life and murder of Sylvia Likens, directed by Tom O'Haver and distributed by First Look Studios. The movie cast Alan Page as Sylvia Likens and Catherine Keener as Gertrude Bazanewski. Really good casting, I thought. Mm. Um, and then, like I said, Evan Peters as... Mm. as um, What's his name? Um, Ricky. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, James Franco played the young baby daddy. James Franco? Yeah. <laughs> played the young baby daddy. Right, uh, okay. Yeah, who hooked up with Gertie and beat her around a bit and yeah. came over to see the tiny baby. Um, uh, the Girl Next Door is loosely based upon the murder of Sylvia Likens. Oh, I don't know if I've seen that one. Released in 2007. It's the same year as American mm. Crime. Starring Blanche Baker, The Girl Next Door is largely inspired by a 1989 novel penned by author Jack Ketcher. There's books uh, by John Dean, the D- Indiana Torches. Oh, he's the reporter, isn't he? John Dean. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there's a 1999 book by him called The Indiana Torture Slaying, Sylvia Likens' Ordeal and Death. Um, another book in 2008, quite nearly 10 years later, called House of Evil, The Indiana Torture Slaying. 
Ooh, am I reading those? <laughs> um, there's one in 1991 by Kate Millett called The Basement Meditations on a Human Sacrifice. Um, television. Ooh. I'm going to have to revisit this. I reckon I've seen it. The Investigation Discovery Channel commissioned a documentary focusing upon the abuse and murder of Sylvia Likens as part of its True Life Prime documentary series, Deadly Women. Oh. We know how much I love Deadly Women. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was a 45-minute documentary titled Born Bad, which was first broadcast on November 30, 2009. I'm going to have to go back and visit that, that one, Born Bad for Deadly Women. Mm. Um, Is there any much else? No, just notes. Um... Um, this, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, the notes are really interesting, actually. Um, so we're wondering about Diana. Why was she not around and only ran, randomly ran into the girls at the mm. park? Because, um, yeah, Diana Shoemaker was somewhat estranged from her family. As such, she was forbidden by her parents to initiate contact with her younger sisters. Was she actually, though? Or is that what good you got? Good no, apparently, uh, apparently she was forbidden by Lester and Elizabeth to even right, okay. have contact with her sisters. Um, Sylvia and her siblings lived in 19 separate addresses between 1949 and 1965, which she ultimately ended up Right, because they were moving around a lot with the Carnies and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, although Lester Likens later test the dad later testified he had known the Bazanuskis were a poor family, he had not checked into the condition of their household before allowing Gertrude to care for his daughters. Okay. It would have been fine, though, because... Well, according to the film anyway, we know that's, you know, fiction based Mm. on real life. But the the house was, you know, a big old double-story house. Like, Mm. I'm sure it looked fine. I don't think he would have, based on appearances, from the outside, anything would have deterred him from leaving his girls there. He would have thought, this has lots of room, lots of bedrooms, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, Following her release from jail, Elizabeth Likens would immediately join her husband in their seasonal employment with the Travelling Carnival as well because she went to jail briefly for shoplifting. Oh, that's right, yeah. Um, Although Stephanie Bezanuski had initially believed the rumours initiated by Paula that Likens had spread distasteful rumours relating to herself and her older sister, as Likens' abuse escalated, she would regularly rally to Likens' defence, occasionally removing objects from her mother or Paula's hands with which they had been striking Likens. So Sylvia that was, was, Ste- was uh, Stephanie, sorry, Stephanie. Was, was the one that, yeah. And they're the one, according to the film anyway, they're the one, they were the two that um, were like friends at first. Like Stephanie, Stephanie and, Sylvia. and Sylvia. Yeah. Like, and even says in this article that they'd sit together and listen to records and stuff. Yeah, yeah. okay. I think they'll do in similar ages. Um, one of the reasons Diana initially believed the strange mm. sister initially believed Sylvia and Jenny had been exaggerating the scale of abuse Sylvia in, in particular endured at the Bezniewski household was that their father had occasionally struck his five children with a belt as a form of discipline for misbehaviour so she kind of thought it was yeah normal. yeah um, as it was back then mm. and after. The injuries discovered upon around Lycan's fingernails will later be described as most likely having been inflicted via her desperate scratching motions. Oh. That's why her nails were fully bent backwards. Oof. That the troll of her tormentors and murderers. Um, in January 1966, Paula Bazanuski gave birth to a baby daughter. She named her Gertrude in honour of her mother. Oh, that's too that's disgusting. Oof. Um, now I'm going to think of the name Gertrude as no, awful. I don't even like the name Gertrude. I, like I never Gertie. liked the name. No. Gertie's cute. No, Hurdy Gertie. No. Gertie reminds me of the Drew Barrymore's character in E.T. She was Gertie. I don't even like D.T. Uh, <laughs> um, contemporary law in Indiana presumed children beneath the age of 15 at the time of offence to be incapable of any criminal intent. Right. Although this presumption could be rebutted by sufficient evidence. Only children younger than seven were completely exempt from prosecution. Right. So the kids who were coming to the house and all that sort of mm. stuff, they were they were not deemed to be able to be indicted mm. because their crimes weren't big enough, I suppose. Yeah, but unlike like John Jr., who yeah. was there and a minor, but yeah. you know, obviously had a part in the mm. yeah. Uh, testimony de- delivered at trial clearly illustrated Paula Bazanuski and her mother as being the most enthusiastic participants in Lycan's abuse and torture. Mm. But that's it. What do you, what do you think? What do I think? Um, people are fucked. Did you watch the film? No. Because it will give me nightmares. I don't think it will give you nightmares. It's just very interesting. I'm just thinking about in comparison to Junko Furuta. Yeah. 
Junker Fruit there were no adults involved, from what I remember. Oh, all teenagers. And they were all teenagers. And it they was didn't all have like a ringleader. No. Was an adult. Not really. Um Yeah. But yeah, totally jealousy on Gertrude's part. Oh, and Paula as well. And Paula. Because apparently Paula, even though she wasn't ugly in the film, according to this, she was kind of ugly. Mm. Not, not mm. as pretty as, as Sylvia. And I, like, yeah, the first thing I said as soon as I saw Sylvia's mm. picture was that she's quite pretty. Mm. She's quite a pretty young girl. Well, even the little picture they've got at Jenny at the proceedings is, she looks like a young Uma Thurman. Like, they're pretty good yeah. looking sisters. That the Carnies had. So it's interesting, yeah, she says, um, cause of death, subdural hematoma, shock, and malnutrition. Yeah, she died of a stroke. Yeah. A stroke, in, like, caused by trauma. Mm-hmm. Didn't they say it was, like, maybe being hit in the head with the Oh, because that or final something? blow that killed her, wasn't it, at the hand of Roy, uh, court, Roy or Coy, or whatever his name is. Um, was it Bork or something? No. no. The curtain rod. Curtain wasn't rod, yeah, that'll curtain do rod it. rod at the end? That, that'll do to it. To the temple? Yeah. That'll do it. And then she went out cold and then one of them dragged her down. Yeah, the and then she was in t- unintelligible for, like, what, two days or something. Yeah, it's fucked. She's like pissing herself and shitting herself. Like, so, but she can't even recite the fucking alphabet. No, she got, it's a D, I think, and that was... And it's just like, you realise that you've now beat her into, like, brain damage even more so than she's already done from the malnutrition. Yeah, it's like, disgusting. She is out of stroke. She's going to die. Mm-hmm. It's just yeah. like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how she lasted that long, to be completely honest. Like. That's what I said about Jungo Fruder as well. It's like, just like, how did she even last that, long? last that long? Like, you just, yeah, when you hear about that, it's just like, fuck, just kill it quickly. Like, yeah. Not that you want someone to be killed. But... And I'm also surprised that um, Sylvia didn't run away, try to run away more times than she did. She probably had no energy. No, but at the same time, she could have just, like, not come home from school. Yeah. Not but, to then, be... but then Jenny would have copped it. Yeah, okay. That makes it more difficult, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. She would have had to, yeah. Although they should have come up more of a plan, really. I mean, that as well, how old was she? 16 and how old was Jenny? Like, 14? Yeah. Still young. And they obviously had no adult supports. They didn't because, yeah, a couple of times they did run into the estranged sister. She didn't believe them. Mm. And there was no way to contact the, the parents. parents or even find where they were. No way to contact the parents. Obviously no teachers cared. No. No one at the church noticed because they went to Sunday school. Yeah, I know. Oh, I, I think according to the film they are just like, oh, yeah, I've noticed that Sylvia hasn't been to Sunday school for... A bit? Yeah. It's like, well, then freaking check. check. Yeah. Like, aren't you all meant to be good church-going people? Or... Yeah. I mean, like, if they give you a, a reason that doesn't sound credible, yeah. check. Oh. Yeah, well, Gertie was saying, like, she obviously kept telling people that she was bad, that Sylvia was bad news and running away with boys and doing questionable things. And so I guess they just believed Gertrude. You know, and if, she does sound like a narcissist, which means she's probably quite charming unless mm. you... Unless you live with her. That is very true. Mm. So I'm sure she would have talked her way out of Mm -hmm. everything. Well. That was an epic one. That was epic. And definitely, yeah. Time for a Disney movie? Oh, yeah. Tell me about it. (laughs) Time for a Disney movie. Well, Sylvia Likens, I would... (laughs) I would definitely go visit her memorial mm. if I was ever in <laughs> in Indianapolis. Indianapolis. I don't think the hell is Indianapolis. It's somewhere in the I states. That's where you have the Indy Five Hundred. I think the it's in the Midwest stuff. somewhere. I What's don't the know. Midwest? <laughs> the Middle West. Oh, right. Midwest. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know when Indiana when Indiana is. It's, it's in Indianapolis. It's in, it's in Indi- no, Indianapolis is in Indiana. Not the other right. way around. Indianapolis is the city. India Indiana is the state. Right. Gotcha. <laughs> she was born in Lebanon, Indiana. 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 Yes. Yes. And then died in Indianapolis. Indianapolis. Yeah. Indiana. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's very confusing. <laughs> anyway, horrific, but we will leave it there. Mm-hmm. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next, next time. time.